Welcome to the Impact Nations podcast, episode 712, A Wide and Big Soul. What is applied theology and why does it matter? Are we all God's children or just those who have prayed the right prayer? And how do we achieve true unity in the body of Christ? Well, Paul had lots to say on these things as he pivots into the second half and the application portion of his letter to the Ephesians. Hello, everyone. We're back together on this journey through the book of Ephesians. And this is a real shifting day because Ephesians is is clearly divided into two sections. And we've just finished the first, which is chapter 1 to 3. And now we're moving into chapters 4, 5, and 6. In the first half, Paul has unveiled the mystery, and that's a key word we've looked at many times, that Christ is the meaning and the fulfillment of all things, and that we as a people who live by faith are participants in that fulfillment. That the meaning of the universe, which he he refers to as the summing up of all things in Christ, it now becomes the, the key essential meaning of our own lives. Paul's told us who and what we are. He's revealed our truest identity. And now in chapters 4 to 6, he unpacks this. He's calling uh, the Ephesians to live according to the truths that he's revealed in the first half and to now put it into practice. You know, theology without practical obedience is just head knowledge. And head knowledge doesn't really make any difference in our lives or the lives of people around us. But on the other hand, to have practice without theology can lead into error. So we need a balance of both in our lives. You know, I feel like there needs to be a real re-emphasis upon applied theology uh, in the teaching that happens in our Western churches. When I was a young pastor, for the first several years, I would, uh, on my on my notepad, when I, when I would begin to do an outline, I would write in block letters, what difference does this make? And if it couldn't answer, what I was teaching couldn't answer that question, then I got rid of it. Why did I do that? Because Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, whoever hears my words, hears this teaching, and puts it into practice builds on the rock. The one who hears the same teaching doesn't put it into practice. He's building on sand. So that's why I put that emphasis and try to keep that emphasis in my teaching all these years. Now, Paul's stress on practical application is is repeated again and again by using the word walk. He says it many, many times. We'll look at this a little more later. And Pardon me. So the conduct he's calling for of of the Ephesian believers is based on the knowledge that he's given to them in the first three chapters. You know, Ephesians chapter 4 to 6 contains more practical application for daily living than any other part of the New Testament. Well, with that introduction, let's begin to look at it. And I want to read all of Uh, verses 1 to 6, and then we'll take it apart. Starting at verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility or lowliness and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Do you see two words emphasized again and again? One and all. And we'll look at that today. So this section is actually divided into two. The the first three verses is an exhortation about deferring to one another in love. The second section establishes this uh, exhortation based on the unity that we find in the Trinity. So let's start at verse 1. Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now, I told you we're shifting into the the second section of the whole letter, and it pivots 
on this word, therefore. Because of the depth of the mystery, because of the great blessings that God has poured out on them, because of their true identity in Christ, in light of these great truths, if they've understood them, Paul is saying, then these truths must become manifest in their lives. Two weeks ago, we talked about new humanity. Now Paul's going to describe the life of this new humanity. This is a movement from theology to ethics, from what Paul has accomplished, what God has accomplished for his people to how they should live as a result. Up till now, Paul has been revealing foundational theological truths. But now he shifts to imperatives. An imperative, I'm an old English teacher, an imperative is in one sense, it's a command. It's, it's calling us to do something. In the first three chapters, Paul used an imperative only once. Now, in chapter 4 through 6, 40 times, he's asking them to do something. And, and he's almost pleading, I beseech, I urge, I beg you. What follows are not a series of suggestions or counseling. Paul is beginning this second section in the strongest possible terms. So let's look at a few phrases in verse 1. In chapter 3, he described himself as a prisoner of Christ. Now he says he's a prisoner in the Lord. Because of his deep convictions regarding the gospel, Paul is willing to suffer the physical pain and isolation of imprisonment in order to remain faithful to Christ and to the Ephesians. In chapter 3, Paul is saying that it was the cause of Christ that made him a prisoner. We talked about that a few sessions ago. But now he's saying, I'm a prisoner in Christ. He's stressing his union with Christ. <clears throat> and this flows from the last thought in chapter 3, which was being filled with the fullness of God. So now with that thought, he's talking about perfect union with Christ. Secondly, Paul comes back to the theme of calling that he expressed near the beginning of this letter. Remember, he said right at the beginning that, that they were chosen before the foundation of the world. So he doesn't ever want to drift away from reminding them, you are called. It's an intentional work of God in your life. And this calling includes spiritual blessings. Now we have this word walk that I mentioned a minute ago. By the way, it's one of Paul's favorite metaphors for, for how we live out our faith. He uses the word walk seven times in Ephesians. And, and his whole ethical teaching here is structured around this word walk. For example, he says, walk worthy of the calling. Walk no longer as the Gentiles do. Walk in love. Walk as children of light. He says, be careful how you walk. Folks, if we're really honest with ourselves, we're more comfortable with ideas, with concepts. You know, for the Jews, they understood that belief is only what we put into practice. And, and that's, I mean, Jesus pointed that out, didn't he, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. But you know, the Greek thought was that ideas, theories themselves, uh, are what we believe. Well, we have very much in the modern era embraced the, the Greek view rather than the Jewish view. But, but the Bible holds strongly. What you believe is what you do, is how you live. Let's go on to verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, the Greek word for humility, or some of your translations say lowliness, does not appear anywhere before New Testament times. Isn't that interesting? In all of the ancient literature, you can't find the word. You know, <clears throat> this is a surprise, <laughs> but in the Greek and Roman worlds, humility was not considered a virtue. It was specifically listed as a quality to avoid in some Roman writing from the 2nd century. In fact, by the late 2nd century, one of the church fathers, 
Origen writes that this Christian virtue of humility became an object of ridicule. But for Paul, he, he gives his life as an example of humility. In Acts 19, remember Paul's meeting with the elders on his way to Jerusalem. He meets with the elders of Ephesus. And he tells them, he says, I've served you with humility. It's significant that Paul lists this characteristic of humility first. Because Paul in this whole section is writing about unity. And perhaps nothing provokes division more than pride. Humility encourages and attracts unity. And the second characteristic, he says, is gentleness or meekness. It's the same word. Eleven times he uses this word in the epistles. And in fact, it's mentioned as one of the fruit of the Spirit. One of the church fathers, Christostom, said this, Meekness, which is, remember, also gentleness. Meekness is the foundation of all virtue. If you are humble and are aware of your limits and remember how you were saved, you will take this recollection as the motive for every excellent moral behavior. And not just meek toward one person and rude toward another, but humble toward everyone, whether enemy or friend, whether great or or small. What a terrific quote. By the way, meekness or gentleness in, in the scriptures, it never means weakness. Instead, it's a conscious exercise of self-control. It, it's a choice of gentleness instead of using power to retaliate or control. It takes great strength, actually, to walk in meekness and gentleness. Another word he uses is patience. And patience is, is the endurance that refuses to abandon hope. It means waiting patiently even when there's no immediate results. Christostom wrote that patience means to have a wide and big soul. I love that definition. Let me say it again. Patience means to have a wide and big soul. I think these three characteristics that Paul's talking about point us toward a, a real need for self-awareness to see where are we in this. You know, for me, for example, uh, patience is sometimes very hard. I'm kind of a type A person, I think less so as I get older, but still, most of us type A's, it's hard for us to be patient. What we see needs to be done, we want to just get on with it. And then he says, bearing with one another in love. You know, there's always going to be differences in the church. Different personalities, different ways of communicating, different priorities, different opinions, and to ignore this is unrealistic. But with these words, Paul tells the Ephesians, don't be upset, don't be unsettled by differences, but, but make room for them, tolerate them. I think this is, is an incredibly vital and timely message for today, because it, it, one of the great pains that, that I'm experiencing and that many are, I was in a discussion with a pastor on this the other day, I think perhaps it is the, the stress and anxiety that COVID brought about that brought things to the surface. And, <coughs> and there's such a, a quickness to alienate within the church, one from another, to, to not tolerate, certainly not to celebrate one another. So besides the normal differences that are in any group, it seems very likely that there were uh, deeper differences between the Jewish and Gentile believers. After all, they're coming to, into one place, one new humanity from completely different cultures. Notice he says one another. Do you know something? One another, which is, is a translation for a, a single Greek word, is so important to Paul that he uses it 40 times in his letters. Isn't that amazing? Really what he's saying is because of our common life in Christ, believers are part of each other. They're to receive one another. 
to pray for one another, to serve one another, to love one another, to build one another up, to bear one another's burdens, to submit to one another, and to encourage one another. And I would add, celebrate one another. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance could only be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by trying harder. Remember, the theme that has been so strong through this series is that we are called to be a new humanity that is a people of the Spirit, a people of the Holy Spirit, and that's the only power source for these characteristics. Well, let's move on. Um, verse 3, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <laughs> We're having a Christostom day. Here's another quote from him. The purpose for which the Spirit was given was to bring into unity all who remain separated by different ethnic or cultural division, young and old, rich and poor, men, uh, women and men. It's because of the working activity of the Spirit that Paul can confidently refer to the church as one new humanity. And when he talks about the bond of peace, this becomes a key word. He, he speaks of peace eight different times in Ephesians. And here he's referring to peace among believers by choosing to embrace moment by moment. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance. This is how we maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's why Jesus said to them, learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly. When I choose to follow Jesus in this journey, I am choosing to lose my life to find it. Remember back in verse 1, Paul declared himself as a prisoner in Christ. This is another way of saying he was yoked to Christ. He was joined to Christ. The great challenge for us through this series is not to get caught up in ideas, but to hold on to the biblical view. What we believe is what we live. Now, on this issue of meekness and gentleness, I want to quote to you, from uh, a book that I wrote a couple of years ago, The Beatitudes for a Time of Crisis. So I'm quoting me. Here we go. My journey to live from the meekness of Christ that is alive in me is marked by my slowly learning to both speak and think with gentleness. For me, this means determining to see Jesus when I see others. In other words, to see and expect the best from them because of Christ in me. This kind of gentleness runs contrary to my natural state, which is anything but gentle. I am not trying harder to be gentle. I am learning to both contemplate and recognize His gentle life at the center of who I really am. This confronts us with an unwavering principle. We either move in the direction of Jesus, who's full of grace and truth, humility and gentleness, and his creation that reflects the Creator, or we move in the opposite direction. This is the direction of self-satisfaction and self-protection of the ego self, and it is the predominant direction of our culture. When we do this, abandoning meekness, we experience cosmic opposition instead of grace. Notice that Peter says we're to clothe ourselves with humility. Like gentleness, it is a choice that over time becomes part of who we truly are. Let's move on. Unity is a, is a product, a result of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Paul is not telling the Ephesians to establish peace or to organize unity. It's already been accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Their role is simply to protect and preserve that unity. They'll do this as they demonstrate humility and gentleness, patience and forbearance. Paul freely acknowledges that this will take effort. And so we keep coming back to this new humanity of learning to walk by the Spirit, 
What does that mean? It means learning to move in the rhythm of heaven. It means fixing our eyes on Jesus. It will always mean, folks, losing our lives. Always to follow Jesus. And what does that mean? It's not martyrdom for most of us. It's losing our preferences, losing our rights, losing our offenses in order to find our real life in Christ. Well, let's go to the second main section of these six verses. Unity is centered on the Trinity. Starting at verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. Now, many scholars believe that that these verses are either a, a, a an early uh, confession of the church or a hymn of the church. And if they're not that, they say, well, at least Paul drew from them and and deliberately structured these verses in a very creedal, liturgical kind of manner. By the way, this text has been called one of the most beautiful in all of the New Testament. It's rich both in its style and its theology. These three verses contain statements that would have likely been widely confessed by the church. Now, we're going to look at it in kind of two layers, one overlapping the other. The first is to look at the structure in three triads, body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, Father is above all, through all, and in all. The principal theme of this passage, as I said, is unity. And Paul uses the word one seven times right after the other, one after another. He is using one to stress not only unity's importance, but that unity reflects the essential nature of the Trinity and therefore the cosmos. So we're going to look at these seven ones, but remember the triads. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. So let's look at one body. It refers to the universal church. I've told you before, Ephesians is the most universal of Paul's letters. He's not speaking to a particular problem in Corinth or Thessalonica. He's speaking to the church. Christostom, again, what is this one body? They are the faithful throughout the world in the present, in the past, and in the future. Isn't that interesting? This is a bigger vision of the universal church, transcending even time. Paul is using the metaphor of one body, and it's an entirely new concept in the New Testament. It shows up in in Romans and 1 Corinthians and Colossians. It is a powerful picture of a living organism that is marked by two things, diversity and unity. Ephesians 1.23, and the church is his body, which is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. And then in chapter 5, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but he nurtures it and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. It's a wonderful metaphor. And he says, one spirit. The Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, is the unifier in this triad. And he never goes very long, does he, without reminding the Ephesians they are people of the Spirit. It is the life of the Spirit that marks, empowers, imparts joy, peace, and grace. This is why we must live in the Spirit. We talked about this. I taught on this a few weeks ago, and Tim and I had a discussion about this. Actively being a people of the Spirit, and not just theoretically. Remember, what we really believe is what we live. Thirdly, one hope. As the church, their hope is not wishful thinking, but eager expectation and complete certainty in what God has promised. Now, New Testament hope involves both the present assurance that he's with the Ephesians in the midst of all they're going through, but also 
it means a certain expectation, uh, a certainty that they will um, inherit the kingdom of God. Well, let's look at the next triad. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. This very, very likely was a baptismal formula that would have been spoken publicly when people were baptized. One Lord. Paul now considers the second person, Christ. When he speaks Lord, he's speaking of Christ. And throughout this letter, eight times, he refers to Christ as Lord. Now, I want you to see something really, really interesting. The single most central scripture, foundational scripture for, for Jews of the Old and New Testament was called the Shema. And it was recited by every devout Jew every single day. And it was Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Ever since his encounter on the road to, to Damascus, to Damascus, Paul has been unwaveringly convinced that Jesus shares this identity, this title, this authority with the Father. In fact, this is reflected in one of the most famous verses. I once heard N.T. Wright say this is his favorite verse in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. You see, for Paul, they're inseparable. One Lord is a declaration made to the people of Ephesus who, remember, lived in a polytheistic society. We talked about that. We talked about the, 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 uh, temple cult in the imperial cult. So he's making a declaration. There's one Lord. Jew and Gentile are united in one Lord. Let's go on to the next one. One faith. Now we can look at this two ways, objectively or subjectively. Objectively, faith is the clear testimony that was in the young church. There was already a common faith, a set core of convictions. But I think he's also speaking subjectively, that, that faith that is exercised by all believers. Um, in Ephesians 1.15, he says, Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord, Jesus, and your love for God's people everywhere. So he's speaking about the faith as this collection of common convictions and beliefs and the exercising of their faith. And then we come to one baptism. And almost certainly he's referring to water baptism. Paul's point here is that the only baptism that exists is baptism into Christ by the Spirit. Because certainly the Christians were not the only people who used the rite of baptism. But he's saying this is the one baptism, baptizing you into Christ. Let me give you two classic scriptures. Colossians 2.12. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. And Romans 6.4. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Lord, now we also may live new lives. Beloved, Paul's saying that if believers have the same Lord, the same faith, the same experience of being baptized into Christ, then they should live this out in unity. And now we come to the seventh, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Well, here we have another triad that is built around Father. The first thing we see is he's the Father of all and that he is uh, the Father who is above and through and in all. Each of these adds a new idea of the nature of the Father's interaction with his creation and the church. This final one has been the focus of much discussion going back at least to the 4th century. 
And here's the issue. Is Paul saying that God is the father of everyone or he is the father of all believers? Now, some insist that Paul can only be speaking of the church. But personally, I think this is too narrow. I think perhaps it's a reflection of a, of a narrow gospel. Paul uses inclusive, universal references elsewhere to the Father. Romans eleven thirty six: For from him and through him and to him are all things. We already looked at a couple of weeks ago at, at chapter 3, 14 and 15, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. An important theme in Ephesians has been stated several times up to this point. Watch this. It's, we're on the all word. We've looked at one. In the midst of it, I also want to remember all. Chapter 1, verse 10. He will sum up all things in Christ. 111, he works all things to accomplish his will. 122, he has subjected all things to Christ. 39, he has created all things. But if we look closely, there are passages which also express that some have been adopted, and he gives some the right to be called the children of God. Jesus recognizes some as the Father's children and others not. So, how are some God's children and others not God's children? I want to go to our dear friend, Brad Jerzak, because he's written on this very issue, and I'm just going to quote Brad because he's so clear. But we also have passages where there are two groups of people, those who are not God's children uh, uh, those who are God's children and those who are not. John 1.12 says that those who receive Christ have the right to become children of God. So you can see why traditionally this verse has become a favorite proof text to say only Christians are God's children. If you receive him, you're a child. If you don't, you're not. This seems clear, but as we'll see, this more exclusive sense of being Abba's children is not actually about confession of faith, or saying the sinner's prayer and then claiming our faith made us God's children. Rather, God's children, in the narrow sense, are those who resemble their father by imitation. It's a really important point, folks. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ refers to children of God in this narrow sense. To be or become God's child literally means to act like Abba. We resemble God when our DNA as Abba's children is actualized, is put into practice. See here, this is what Jesus said. <coughs> but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we see the Bible speaking of God's children in two distinct ways. So in what way is it that, that some are God's children and others are not? Well, to look at this issue, I, I want to quote our dear friend, Brad Jerzak. Uh, he's written an excellent article, and, and I want to just share that with you. But we also have passages where there are two groups of people, those who are God's children and those who are not. John 1.12 says that those who receive Christ have the right to become children of God. You can see why traditionally this verse became a favorite proof text to say that only Christians are God's children. If you receive him, you're a child. If you don't, you're not. Well, this seems clear. But as we're about to see, uh, this more exclusive sense of being uh, Abba's children is not actually about confession of faith or saying the sinner's prayer and then claiming our faith made us God's children. Rather, God's children, in the narrow sense, are those who resemble their father by imitation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ refers to children of God in this narrow sense. To be or become God's child literally means to act like Abba. 
We resemble God when our DNA as Abba's children is actualized. See here. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we see the Bible speaking of God's children in two very distinct ways. The first is that all are Abba's children because he created us all in his image. Even in our rebellion, Abba never disowns us or kicks us out of the family. His forgiveness follows us out the door and his mercy pursues us all the days of our lives. Whether we're wasting our lives on hedonism like the younger son or continuing in religious slavery like the older son, we are still all God's beloved children. But at the same time, some are recognized as Abba's children because they imitate their Abba in their love of Jesus Christ. And this is what is meant by receiving him. In their grace and generosity to all, and in their peacemaking and imitation of Abba's character in their lives, this imitation is, of course, the work of transforming grace and actualize as we willingly surrender our lives to Abba's love and follow his one unique son on the Jesus way. So I hope that helps us to understand the two aspects of, of being father's children. Well, let's move on. How the father interacts with his creation. Paul uses three words, over, through, and in all. Quoting Origen, the, one of the church fathers that I love, God's majesty is denoted by the phrase above all. God's all-sufficiency is denoted by the words through all. It also belongs to the power of God to penetrate into all, so that because of his being in all, no one is entirely void of him. Isn't that interesting? He is over all. Paul is declaring the a uh, father's sovereign position over his creation, which includes you and I. Every aspect of our lives, every situation he is sovereign over. Now, if we take this sovereignty seriously, then it leads to confidence and contentment in the midst of every challenge, of every struggle, because we know the transcendent father has got it all under control. He not only has authority over the cosmos, he watches over it and cares for it. So being over all includes you and me. Secondly, the Father works through, through all. And I think this really means he works through us. Remember, we'll go back again to the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, he, that, that the blessing of God comes to through and from a people. He, his church, we're his representatives. We are the outworkers of who he is and what he desires. If we take this seriously, we will put it into practice. If we take it seriously, we'll always remember we are on assignment. We're not passive. I need to remind myself of this uh, often. In fact, I was in a discussion yesterday about this. I cannot be passive. Remember in chapter 2, we saw that Paul told the Ephesians they are God's workmanship intended for good works. Thirdly, the Father is in us. Here we see the outworking of our understanding of the Father of all. Do we see and look for the triune God only in our fellow believers and not outside of that boundary that we create? Do we fundamentally see the world in the terms of us and them? Or do we see the activity of the Trinity always at work all around us? This issue directly impacts our gospel message. If we see the fatherhood of God exclusively, it's just for believers. This leads to a gospel that says you are alienated from God if you are not a believer. You are out. 
You, you do not know him, so you need to repent so that you can know him. If we see the fatherhood of God inclusively, then our message becomes one of coming home, which I think is the central message of the, the story of the prodigal son. It's a gospel that says, your father has never been separated from you for a moment. He's never excluded you. He has always been with you. So you can turn your heart. It's an invitation. You can turn your heart. You can turn your life to him to live in the goodness that is already yours. You see how important it is how we see the fatherhood of God? Well, let's look at the Trinity. Paul's discourse on unity here's another paradigm, is built on the Trinity. Because the Trinity is both the model and the life source for our unity. Perfect union in the midst of diversity is what flows out of the Trinity. Three persons distinct in one. The church is empowered and vitalized by the Holy Spirit. We see that in these verses. We have one hope. The church is united in its one Lord, that's Christ. We hold on to and live a common faith. We identify with Christ through one baptism. So you see the Spirit he presents first. Notice the reverse order of the usual Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He presents the, the role of the Spirit, and then of Christ, and thirdly, the Father is supreme over all, and he operates through and resides in all. And this is true, Paul is saying to the Ephesians and by extension to us, his, his operating and residing in all is true both individually, you and I, and us as a community. The Trinity is both the model and the center, the life source of our unity. And this is why I continue to insist that we must focus, we must meditate, we must live our lives with a great awareness of the Trinity. As I've said to you before, God is not like Trinity. God is Trinity. And so just to wrap this up, in these six powerful verses, Paul has laid the foundation and presented his introduction for all that will follow, all the very practical exhortations that are about to follow this. We need to consider carefully how we view the fatherhood of God. It will determine the gospel that we carry. So this is not a small issue. This is central. As always, we are faced with the question, is our gospel beautiful? God bless you. We'll just meet together with Tim in a minute or two to discuss some of the issues that have come up today. Now what? The gospel is meant to be lived. We now invite you to be a part of the discussion as we talk about how to apply this teaching. YouTube viewers can use the comments section below. You can also email your questions and comments to podcast at impactnations.com. Well, as you said, we have pivoted <laughs> uh, and definitely a shift in tone uh, yeah. in terms of that practical application. Yep. Um, interesting to learn a little bit about applied theology. Uh, I, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second, but I forgot. I got to tell people, uh, remind people about our Survive to Thrive campaign. Mm. Uh, we are, as our uh, Impact Nations family knows, are in the throes of our annual Survive to Thrive campaign. Uh, and we always surround this around Mother's Day because... Uh, we love leading up to Mother's Day. We love to just highlight these incredible mothers and mothers-to-be in Uganda, these young women who are overcoming incredible odds um, with the help of Jesus Christ who has come alongside and empowered them. And, uh, you know, our team is there to help these young women discover their destiny and rec recognize that they were born to have dignity, and they do indeed have dignity in Christ. Uh, and so the some of the stories that we see coming out of Uganda are so beautiful of these young women. Um, as I say, overcoming abuse, homelessness, neglect, uh, and these these pregnant teens with nowhere to turn, and suddenly they've got hope again. Yeah. Uh, in fact, here, just, I'm going to have Isaiah 
play a video. So if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see the video, but it's, it is in English and it's only about 10 seconds long. Uh, but, uh, this, this is just a glimpse of, uh, what restored hope looks like. Here's, here's a young lady from Uganda saying thanks. Thank you, Remnant Generation and Impact Nations for saving my life and my baby. Now that's just, that was a snippet taken out of a, a longer video where she tells her story. And uh, you can see that story at impactnations.com slash thrive. We've actually got a few videos on that page. Uh, and uh, I watched one last week it's, and I teared up. Yeah, it's it's quite extraordinary. Uh, those videos should come with a trigger warning, by the way, as we've said, uh, these, these young women have uh, overcome some pretty horrific circumstances, but they have overcome. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more just like them that need rescue. And that's where you come in. Uh, you can help us rescue a pregnant teen in Uganda, rescue this young mother. So for Mother's Day this year, uh, help us absolutely change the entire trajectory, the entire future for a young mom and her baby. Uh, we're talking about literally saving lives here. So uh, we need your help to do that. So if you go to impactnations.com slash thrive, uh, you can learn all about it and you can give. Uh, Isaiah's worked on a whole new donation form actually there. So we're trying something new. I think you're going to like it. Uh, so go check it out. Impactnations.com slash thrive. All right. Uh, Ephesians 4. You talked today about this, this concept of one body. You were talking a lot about unity. And right at the end there, you kind of, uh, as always, gave us a almost a, a much bigger, I would almost say, cosmic understanding of unity as you pointed back to the Trinity, as Paul is pointing us back to the Trinity. Um, and yet you, you also continue to bring us back to this idea of diversity so that the, the family, this one body is diverse and unified. And sometimes it can feel like, especially in this culture at times, that there is tension between those things. Um, how do we, how do we live? How do, let me ask, I got so many questions. How do churches actively pursue diversity? Let's, let's start with that. And okay. why is it important? Actively pursue diversity, diversity of gifts or cultural diversity. You name it. All right. Well, <laughs> I cultural, think both are important. Cultural diversity we've talked about before. I think we've got to be intentional and proactive and uh, reach out into different cultures, not only uh, corporately, communally, but the individual members. Yeah. Diversity of gifts and callings. And we're going to talk quite a bit about that next week. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that one of the things is you have a culture, just as we've talked before, having a culture that that is um, mistake tolerant and celebrates risk. Mm -hmm. We need a culture that celebrates our diversity, that celebrates one another. Uh, I always encourage people, find a place where they celebrate you, not tolerate mm. you. Yeah. And um, we need to teach some out of uh, Romans 12, out of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, to see that there's this richness that comes, not as, as we try to do a sameness, but rather, wow, we really celebrate what you've got, what you bring, mm -hmm. and not to be threatened by somebody else's yeah. gift. It can come at the, co I would say that unity sometimes can come at the cost of diversity because we tend to perhaps kind of close down, like, well, if we only have people who think like us, uh, then we're more likely to actually have unity. Um, and yet unity has to be so much bigger and must be Christ centered because I think sometimes by thinking that way, we, 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 uh, move into uniformity, not yep. unity. Yep. And there's a big difference between those two words. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uniformity can become anything other than Christ centered, whereas unity must only be Christ centered. It's the only way to have it. Yeah, exactly. What, what's the difference, do you think, between uniformity and unity in, in practice? Unity is we are united in Christ. And, and you know, uh, Ralph Neighbor used to say 35 years ago, the Christ in me recognizes the Christ mm. in you. And that's why Paul said, I'm a prisoner in Christ yeah. this time. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's the key, recognizing. You know, um, St. Francis of Assisi, he... He described um, maturity mm -hmm. in in appreciating everyone. Yeah. Find wow, that's great about you. Mm -hmm. So I think that that that's it. Uniformity is always 
we're back to exclusiveness. Mm -hmm. We're back to fear. It's got to, we got to keep it under control. You cannot control the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if we're a people of the Spirit, you yeah. can't control it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I the, the unity you describe is so beautiful, and yet it means we must continue to just keep coming back to Christ is the center. And we've got to remind one another because it's so quick, it's so easy to veer into uniformity and think you're accomplishing unity because nobody's disagreeing with one another. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and we we can even in unspoken or spoken ways mm -hmm. demand that uniformity to flow out. That well, we all have the same political views. Sure, we all have the same views on uh, refugees and immigration. Sure. We all that, it, that's where it spills out and becomes, I think, even more unhealthy. What do you think about theological views? Because I think that it's important for us to understand, for starters, that. There are some things that we must be, yes. uh, I don't know if closed minded is the right idea, but you know, we must stand firm these on these the foundations hey, of our Christ faith. lived, died, rose again, and we find our salvation in him and in him alone. Uh, those are the things we must hold firm to. But there's lots of things that my friends and I and, and even church leadership and stuff may disagree with with me on. Yeah. And yet we can still be unified in Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, in terms of, so that we don't just drift off. Cause I remember I, I, I talked today that, that our theology has got to be put into practice, mm -hmm. but we've got to have theology. Yeah. If we don't have those basics, I, you and I know that our statement of faith is the Nicene Creed. Indeed. And, and I think that if we would be more creedal, we would understand, oh, this lines up. Yeah. Uh, lots to think about there and very humbling. And I think you, you talked about humility as very countercultural uh, at the beginning of today's uh, teaching and, and countercultural even in Paul's day uh, yes. where they, they were not even really using the word uh, for the most part. And when they did, it was more of a, a derision than something to be praised. Uh, it was a humble behavior of mm. those who are are, mm. are walking in humility. And yet, if we are going to walk in unity, we must find a way to walk in humility. What is what does humility look like in practice? Uh, like, what are the marks of someone who is walking in genuine humility? Genuine humility. <laughs> okay, um, I think that they are not trying to draw attention to themselves. Mm. I think that they are preferring others. Uh, I think that Philippians chapter two, the first four verses are a wonderful example of that. That humility isn't just an attitude, it's a choice. Mm. And I choose to empty myself. We're back yeah. to canonic love. Mm -hmm. I choose to prefer you. And do you know the other thing that, that I've been thinking about, and maybe I'm just gonna create a problem for you now, <laughs> but as I look at sermon series and i recently was doing i was just checking out some churches and i look at them they're not humble series mm. how to be successful one i saw the other day it was x number of of principles ways that you can prosper oh boy <laughs> um yeah but but they're like that all the time yeah. how to overcome this and overcome mm -hmm. that and overcome this and 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 i you know, I've just gone down a little bit of a rabbit trail, but even that, what we present, in our case from the pulpit, what we present from leadership, mm -hmm. um, I think needs to be uh, humility, needs to be gentleness, needs to be meekness, needs yeah. to be forbearance from the front. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you read that quote from Brad. And I, it was pretty challenging because it, uh, this has often been a topic of discussion in my house in terms of uh, are we all children of God or just those who have surrendered their lives to Christ, uh, turned to Christ, however you want to say it, uh, pray, prayed the prayer if you're from that particular tradition. But um, Brad, as always in that quote that you had there, did a good job of actually just facing the facts, which are, there are scriptures that say both, uh, or imply both at the very least. And yet, uh, Brad calls us to a higher standard, which is basically if we are imitators of Abba, if we if we live like uh, like Abba, then we can be called children of God. Now, I can, I can almost hear uh, some of our listeners self-disqualifying, like, well, 
never mind. I can't, I can't be considered a child of God because that's not possible for me. I can't do it. It's all about what direction are we leaning into? What direction mm. is our heart? Yeah. And that's why it's about following him. It's about, you know, um, Hebrews 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's about the lifelong journey yeah. of becoming more and more conformed to his image. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, 29. That's it. But, but, but overarching, he is overall. And I'm absolutely convinced that the, what Christ did on the cross, he did for everybody and he didn't do it conditionally. Yeah. Our jobs to let people know the good news of what's already been done. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you mentioned the phrase applied theology today and uh, you earlier today in the office, I heard you say something about you got a new systematic theology uh, book and that kind of piqued my interest because I know you've been wary of, of some systematic theology uh, in the past. Can you tell us how do we uh, study theology and make sure that we are always applying it? Like, are there some good sources to go to for that where mm -hmm. we're not just studying theology for the sake of it, but it is, it, we're, being given it into practical practice. application. A yeah. little bit like I did on the second last book. Yeah. Um, what's it called? The First Church Restored. <laughs> Putting it into practice yeah. at the end of about 10 yeah. chapters. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you off the top of my head uh, systematic theologies that have that. Um, actually, Grudem, Wayne Grudem says a little bit of it, mm -hmm. but I'm not very comfortable with a lot of his theology. Indeed. Um, and I sure never throw theology away. You know, I study it all the time. Of course, we talk about but, it here lots. But, um, but <laughs> head knowledge. Yeah. You know, if it's not practical, it's head knowledge. And I don't think it does anybody any good. Mm -hmm. And it might even have a negative influence uh, that causes us to be self confident or, you know, whatever. Sure. Um, I think it is so, so, so important to, okay, what difference does it make? Yeah. And, um, and I, I find, have found over years when I, my post pastoring years too often, it's, it's interesting, but what do I do with it? Yeah. Yeah. Look at Jesus teaching. It was <laughs> always supremely practical. Indeed. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to recommend a resource. Uh, <laughs> you actually, you got a little meta today and he said, I'm going to quote myself, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, dad was reading, uh, from this book and I apologize. I can't see with the lights, whether or not you get a bad glare on that camera or not, but this is the Beatitudes. Um, uh, the Beatitudes for a Time of Crisis is a book you wrote a few years ago as we were in the throes of, of 2020, uh, right in the middle of uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic. And then we had, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and protests all over America and things like that. We were very much in a time of crisis. Uh, and so as you wrote this book, studying uh, Christ's teaching uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, specifically on the Beatitudes, you just gave us some real practical stuff. Um, basically line by line right out of the Beatitudes. And so there's, I think this is excellent theology that also gives us some, some good practice. So I'm going to strongly recommend this book. If you don't have uh, this book yet, then pick it up. Uh, you can get it at uh, impactnations.com uh, and just hit shop and you'll find it there. But uh, I'm actually going to do a little thing uh, today because we are uh, really wanting you to engage in our Survive to Thrive campaign uh, for rescuing these young ladies in uh in Uganda. So here's the deal. If you uh, go to impactnations.com slash thrive uh, and you make a, a gift to rescue uh, a young woman and her baby, uh, if you write in the comments, you just write Beatitudes, we will ship you a copy of the Beatitudes for free. Um, you can purchase the book for 20 bucks. Uh, and hey, if you want to add that onto your onto your gift to cover the cost of that too, that's even better. But uh, gifts of $50 or more, uh, write Beatitudes in the comments and we'll ship you a copy of this. Um, and I know it's really going to bless you and encourage you and equip you uh, for uh, meekness, if nothing else. <laughs> it's, it's actually my favorite. Really? Of the books that yeah. I've written so far. Yeah, we've got yeah. a lot of really, really good feedback on it. So uh, if you haven't read it, 
check it out and you can get that by making a $50 gift at uh, impactnations.com slash thrive or you can go buy it for 20 bucks uh, at uh, at the Impact Nations uh, website impactnations.com uh, thank you so much for being with us this week we're going to continue uh, Ephesians chapter 4 next week we're here every Thursday uh, you can find us on YouTube do be sure to hit subscribe then hit that little bell um, and uh, if you'd rather you can subscribe on your favorite podcast app you'll get the audio delivered right to your device so you can listen to that on your way to or from work uh don't listen to it while you're at work you're supposed to be doing your job but you can listen to it on your way to <laughs> or from or while you're doing the dishes or whatever too um uh, or you can just head to impactnations.com slash podcast you can find both the youtube or the audio there uh all cataloged nice for you so thank you for being with us and we will see you again next week god, god bless, bless.